We accept the reality of the world with which we're presenting. It's as simple as that. We no longer live in a world of nations and ideologies, Mr. Beale. The world is a business, Mr. Beale. Go on without me. It's just go. A good soldier never leaves a man behind. Because I wouldn't give you two cents for all your fancy rules if behind them they didn't have a little bit of plain, ordinary, everyday kindness. Life, uh, finds a way. Welcome to Silver Screen Biases. Each week we pick a movie off of IMDb's Top 250 and dig into it. We're examining truth claims in critically acclaimed movies while also examining our own biases. I'm Nelson. This is Jeff. And this week... Grand Torino. This episode is brought to you by our community on Patreon. They make this show happen and you can help. Links to our Patreon and merchandise are in the show notes. If you enjoy what we're doing, please like, comment, but especially share. It has a lot to help. You can also send us a text message by, like, by clicking the link below. And now back to the show. Jeff. Hey. What are our off to 50 Patreon uh, only options this month? Yeah. So, um, Robin Hood. Mm-hmm. Robin Hood. Yeah. Robin Hood. And there's a fourth one, right? Uh, Robin Hood. But, that's right. That's right. But animated. But animated. Yeah. So uh, this month, uh, instead of just three options, you have four to pick from. Uh, four different Robin Hoods. Russell Crowe, Kevin Costner, uh, whoever mm. was the fox, and the other one. What, which one am I missing? Oh, Robin Hood, Men and Dites. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Carrie Elwes was that Robin Hood. All right. Uh, moving right along. Oh, actually, sorry, I should say, uh, if you're interested in hearing our thoughts on one of the four Robin Hoods or interested in helping us decide which Robin Hood to watch, click through to our Patreon. $5 a month gets you access to our Off to 50 episodes. You can also listen to the Off to 50 episodes for $3 each if you don't want to pay $5 a month. Just listen to the ones you like. Uh, and to vote, you need to be a contributing member. All right. And and just one last little plug then for December we're we're doing Christmas movies. Um I know it's strange, but yeah. um we don't we currently need, have any on the list. So instead of making Nelson and I pick, um any um subscribing member of our Patreon can submit Christmas movies for us to talk about. Ones that we have us, not already done. So if it's up to us, it's gonna be Gremlins, Die Hard. Well we I guess we already did Die Hard. We do Die Hard too. Is it all it Christmas? Place, it takes place during winter. There's snowmobiling. Jacob, what's a good Jacob's our guest this week, by the way. Let's one heck of a way to introduce him. Welcome, uh, Jacob. <laughs> Jacob Wendegrad, host of the Biblical Anarchy Podcast, formerly the Daniel Three Biblical Anarchy Podcast. We've had him on before. Uh we had him on for uh Schindler's List. Jacob, what's a great not Christmas movie, Christmas movie that we could throw in our off to fifty options? Hmm. Well, that's a hard a great not Christmas Christmas movie. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think you already you already mentioned Die Hard because that's the only one that really comes to mind. We got Die Hard. I think. In fact, we covered yeah. that one with our in the top two fifty. It's on the top two fifty. Yeah. Um, um, a lot of people put the first Harry Potter on mm. as a Christmas movie and and a Halloween movie. Yeah. Because there's like thirty seconds of it snowing Where it's Christmas and they've got Christmas and there's a there's a gift. So yeah. some people put that in it on the Christmas list and that's one I mean, that I'm like it's not really a Christmas movie. I guess if that counts, then so would uh, uh, The Shining. <laughs> yeah, which we've already I mean, covered. Yeah, there, there. So, so this is still a Christmas movie, but it's not a typical Christmas movie. Um, Great, and it's one of the few. Like, I don't like a lot of newer movies, but this one I actually really enjoyed. It's a uh, Violent Night, and it's basically oh, yeah. like, uh, like it actually is. If Die Hard was a Christmas movie, like, like <laughs> legit. It would be this movie right. almost. <laughs> but, is that so, the? I mean, it's, oh no, I'm thinking. I was thinking because uh, Mel Gibson did it one where he was Santa, but that was uh, Fat Man. Uh, no, I this one was a uh, David. Uh, crap, I'm getting his last name. Uh, That's one heck of a name. Oh, David um, Harbor. David Harbor from Star oh, yeah. Wars. Yeah, yeah, John yeah. Leguizamo. But it was so good. Yeah, he's Santa Claus, and he's just like he's yeah. literally John McClane style just like <laughs> taking out a bunch of mercenaries that are uh i mean it's it's like it like if you just describe the movie on its face you're just like yeah that that sounds like one of those like you know weird like indie movies you pick up like you know back in the day at like blockbuster and you're like this is like this is a drinking game movie you know nothing <laughs> yeah. something that would actually be 
you know, high quality, but it was actually really good. I'll have to check that out. That's Violent funny. Night. Violent uh, Night, yep. Jacob, uh, last time we had you on for Schindler's List, not knowing that you yourself are Jewish ancestry, and then you've chosen Gran Torino, are you also Hmong? <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, uh, not, I mean, I've never done the, uh, what is it? Ancestry.com or 21 and me. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure the government has my blood and DNA samples somehow anyway, but sure. Uh, oh, yeah. I gotta make it hard for them. So I can't, I can't <laughs> confirm or deny that yet unknown. It's a good All right. <laughs> uh, um, before we get into this movie pretty deep, um, Last episode, um, we had you on Schindler's List. We asked you a couple questions about political, religious biases, and we talked a little bit of some movies then, and I'm sure we'll talk about movies today. But um, we've got a new question for you just to get a little bit more insight for our listeners. And that question is, what's something you've changed your mind about? Hmm. Could be anything. Something I have changed my mind about. Um, that, that is a, that's a tough one. I mean... I'm trying not to go for like the low hanging fruit here. I'm trying to pick something that's a little bit less obvious, I guess. I mean, obviously I've changed my political views a lot, uh, but I mean, maybe we'll go a little bit uh, religious here. I mean, I, uh, when I, I was raised in a conservative household and with like the traditional view on, uh, Christian marriage, but I rejected that and thought that the Bible didn't actually make a strong case for prohibitions on on gay marriage and uh, or even like transgender ideology. And uh, I, you know, I, I didn't really have incentives to change my mind on that, but I kind of like just by being faithful to what Scripture teaches and uh, following that. Uh, now, I, I would say my my view is more or less ortho, what what the Orthodox Christian view is, although I think it's often poorly expressed, and too many Christians who I think just kind of you know cite Leviticus and end the case at that. But uh, or worse, they'll cite yeah, that's Sodom a, and Gomorrah. Well, that's actually the worst one to cite, to be honest. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's something I've. Ch- I mean, I change my mind on a lot of little things all the time. I think, and obviously, mm-hmm. you know my political views radically changed. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything like funny I've changed my mind on. Um, but nothing's actually, okay, no, here, here's a good one. I changed my mind on Indian food. I used to okay. hate, like absolutely. I thought there was like no, I, was, I didn't think there was anything redeeming about Indian food. I thought it was extremely overrated. And then I just realized that I live in York, Pennsylvania and <laughs> there's no good Indian <laughs> restaurants near me. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, once I finally made it out of my small little town and discovered uh, a really good Indian restaurant down in uh, down in like the Maryland, almost D.C. area, um, I changed my then mind. Then you realized that you were right. <laughs> now it wasn't just an assumption. <laughs> you knew it for a fact. <laughs> well, I realized that, you know, I mean, Trump's got the right idea that we need to deport all the immigrants and, and we need to import more Indians because we actually mm. need more Indian restaurants opened up. Mm. We do have a lot of Scottish restaurants. Um, McDonald's, probably the yeah. best known one. Um, that's the one, the <laughs> Tilted Kilt. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a good Those are the big two. restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, thought, I thought the McDonald's had just been rebranded to the Donald now. The, the Donald. Donald. <laughs> yes. I hear he's going to fix the ice cream machines. Yeah. <laughs> At the time of recording, the election has not yet happened, <laughs> but at the time of release, uh, the, episode, the, the election uh, is hopefully in a distant mirror, and, and we're all very satisfied with the results, and nobody has yeah. any questions. All of America is on the same page yep. as of this time. Yeah. With a, <laughs> and we're moving forward together. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Unity. There's no way that we're not going to be hurting after next week. Or after, yeah, it's just we're all going to be on the same page. <laughs> really stuck the landing there, Jeff. Yeah, yeah, I committed committed to the bit. Yeah, I was struggling. Yeah, well, but this, all right. So this week we were talking about Grand Torino, two thousand eight. This is the year I graduated. Yeah, um, you're old. I, I uh, old enough. Yeah, um, thirty five, thirty six. I'm thirty five. Yeah. I'll okay. Be, yep. 
Yeah, pretty fresh 35. I, I graduated 11, so I can I can do math. Yeah. Yay. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't... I, I want to say I saw this in theaters, but I don't remember the context because this is not a movie I would have pursued when I was, was on, when I was graduating high school. It's like, I don't, but I feel like I saw this movie in theaters, but have any, have either of you guys watched this movie before? Or is this your first time? I watched a low quality bootleg of this shortly after it came out and I haven't seen it since. Okay. I remember liking it though. I, I watched it with my family when it came out. I was still living at home at the time, and I liked it then. And then, not connected to like, I actually just rewatched it for just wanting to rewatch it. Probably like a couple weeks before I even re- like was talking to Nelson and suggested coming back on the show. And I, mm. like, we were like looking at move. I was mo- looking at movies still on the list, and I saw uh, Gran Torino. I was like, no one's taken this yet. I was like, mine. <laughs> like, I just watched this. That's perfect. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've, while I've you're getting in it. touch with your Hmong roots, right? Right, exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. returned to tradition. Yeah. <laughs> Man, I'll Reject tell you what. Embrace I, Hmong. Everything I know about that real culture, Hmong Judaism hasn't been tried. <laughs> <laughs> it starts today, folks. Um, everything I know about that culture, I've learned from this film, and I'll tell you what: they seem like pleasant people, especially with all the food and cooking. I could really get into that lifestyle. So Dude, the, there's yeah, uh, meals for everything. I just love the beginning yeah, yeah. when Walt Walt spits his chewing tobacco out, and then the grandma just like like the big <laughs> yeah the spits so much giant. more yeah yeah. So this, I uh, this move, yeah go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was just gonna say I haven't seen this since it came out, and from memory they were Japanese, but they're they're not. And uh, but I I've learned quite a lot about Hmong culture in the last couple of years, um, because of I watch a lot of like food travel youtube and there was one guy that was traveling around the areas that they're from but then he came back to the states and went to some of the more densely Hmong population areas and was speaking to like third and fourth generation who have Hmong restaurants so i i i've been learning a bit about the culture already and it's a pretty like oh it's it's not a very uniform culture right because they are hill people right you you go to the next hill over and then you're going to have different communities different cultures and uh but it is a an interesting diaspora. Yeah, yeah. that's the it's word just, I was it's, gonna it's use. It's just like it's like New Jerseyans and, and uh <laughs> people living in Brooklyn, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. One's people and one's not. <laughs> Don't know which. <laughs> uh so yeah, two thousand eight. This movie's a little under two hours, an hour and fifty six minutes. It is rated R. Directed by and starring Clint Eastwood. Some of his directorial um, features are most recently he had a movie. It's either, I think it's, hold on, I've got it brought up here. Juror number two comes out November 1st. Okay, so the weekend we're recording this, this movie comes out, but his next movie comes out, uh, Juror number two with Nicholas Holt, Juror number two, Juror number two. Um, but he also has done The Mule, The 1517 Into Paris, Sully. American Sniper, Jersey Boys, J. Edgar, Invictus, Letters from Iwo Jima, Flags of Our Fathers, Million Dollar Baby, Mystic River, Space Cowboys, The Bridges of Madison County, Unforgiven, which we've seen, and Sudden Impact, Dirty Harry. Sudden Impact, comma, Dirty Harry. Those are two separate. Um, <laughs> it's it'd be now, a weird film. Uh, of those, a handful have been in the top 250. Mm-hmm. Now, we were talking last week about a movie that you hadn't heard of. Really? Yeah, uh, when we were talking about Deer Hunter, I yes. told you that the director of Deer Hunter had written several movies as well. One of those that he wrote was The Outlaw Josie Wales, which was directed and starring Clint Eastwood and was up for a time on the top 250. Mystic River also was on the top 250, Letters from Iwo Jima, and Changeling, which I'd not heard mm. of. All of those were currently on the top 250 that's left for us to cover by Mr. Clint Eastwood is Million Dollar Baby. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Like I said, noted libertarian, out... by the way. Is wait, Clint Eastwood is? Yep. Really? Yep. Oh, well, there you go. Out, That's outspoken. why he wasn't at the Trump rally. <laughs> that makes sense. I was looking for that, him. and he's in his nineties uh, and has better yeah, things to do. That that could also be. <laughs> yeah. Um. 
this movie came out in 2008. We've done uh, multiple movies from 2007 that have released in that year. Into the Wild, No Country for Old Men, There Will Be Blood, Ratatouille, and Charlie Bartlett went on the off 250. But um, the year that this movie came out was also Wally in the Dark Knight, which we've already covered. And nothing from 2009 currently that we've done um, in the surrounding years of this movie's release. Anything else on the 2008 radar, Nelson? Well, there's a lot of other things that did come out in 2008, including Changeling. So he directed two that year, and both of them hit the top 250. Uh, but Dark Knight and Wally are the only other two currently in the top 250. Gotcha. Okay. That was a short list today. Um, is this movie based on any sort of pre-existing writing, literature, anything like that, or is this a original concept? Original concept. Clint Eastwood read the script, liked it, and directed it, and starred in it. So yeah, original screenplay, not based right. off anything. Right, on. I um, as I was going through the cast, I was expecting for me not to be familiar with many of the cast members. And this was even after watching the movie. I'm like, I don't recognize many except for Clint Eastwood. But I was surprised at how many had some small little connections to things we've done or stuff like that. So um, first and foremost, Clint Eastwood. Mm-hmm. Um, his acting sheet is a little different than his directing sheet. Mm. Um, the Mule, American Sniper, Trouble with the Curve, Million Dollar Baby, Space Cowboys, The Bridges of Madison County, and The Line of Fire, Unforgiven, Sudden Impact, Any Which Way You Can, Escape from Alcatraz, Every Which Way But Loose, Thunderbolt and Lightfoot, which we talked about. There was a connection to the Deer Hunter. Yeah, uh, the same, same writer. Yep. Uh, Dirty Harry, Kelly's Heroes, Two Mules for Sister Sarah, Hang em High, The Good, The Bad, The Ugly. For a few dollars more, a rawhide and a fistful of dollars. Mm -hmm. Um, Lots of Westerns early on in his career. Yeah. And I would say, honestly, in a lot of ways, this movie is also a Western. Like, in all the thematic elements, all the beats that it hits. Hmm. Kind of, yeah. I see what you mean. It's like a, it's, it's like a, uh, what's the word here? Uh, It's like a, a foil for a Western almost, like a modern foil. In a, in a yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I say this unironically. Uh, the Wolverine also is. No, no, sorry. Um, not the Wolverine. What's Logan? the w- Logan? Yeah, yeah. That one. Thank yeah. you. Logan's yeah. also very much a Western. This one, I think, yeah. is a lot more subtle in how much of it's a Western. I, um, I would definitely compare his character to like an outlaw. Like, not really any disregard for any other sort of, I mean, very, a very libertarian mindset in a, yeah. in a positive way. Of he's like, an anti-hero. Just like, he, he's doing his own thing and he'll take matters into his own hands regardless of the consequences. And so I can see an outlaw comparison. I guess it's just hard to think of a Western with a nice hot rod car and well, you swap it for a horse. Yeah. And like you, you make it dustier. You swap the car for a horse. Yeah. You make him you a swap civil the war guns vet for a hand. <laughs> I, I think in a lot of ways this movie is a is a is a very like like Jacob was saying a foil for a modern western. Yeah, I I can see that. The more, I'm, yeah. Um, so Anna, I'm going to mess up some of these names. Anna Her, uh, she played Sue. Um, she was in Batman versus Superman. Um, so there's so she has had more Hollywood time. She there. was one of the Batarangs. <laughs> People actually watch Batman vs. Superman? Oh my gosh. Jeff did. Yeah. Like <laughs> four times in theaters. You Superman's the my Ultimate favorite edition? <laughs> I did. Superman's my favorite superhero. Even if they keep canceling them and restarting, canceling and restarting. If there's a super movie coming out, I will go watch it. Are you um, excited my... for Crypto the Superdog? Not as much as I'm excited for the new Superman my... movie. Superman's but... my favorite superhero to have a movie with a CGI mouth. <laughs> yeah a cgi just, lack of mustache she just couldn't sh- yeah. yeah just couldn't shave the mustache yeah uh brian haley he played um one of the sons of clint eastwood's character mitch he was in draft day adjustment bureau the taking of palem 123 the departed pearl harbor that darn cat the 197 1997 version mars attacks and little giants um so he's been around for a little oh, bit oh you missed a big one for he him? was in Who? baby's day out Baby's day out. So, okay. <laughs> I missed. I missed. 
<laughs> I, I was I looking at things he's entirely. known for, and it was this and Baby's Day Out. <laughs> there you go. Uh, <laughs> Geraldine Hughes, she was one of the wives of the brothers. Yeah. Um, of the, the sons to Clint Eastwood. Um, she was in Killing Lincoln, which was a t- made-for-TV adaptation of um, a Bill O'Reilly book. Mm-hmm. And then she was also in Rocky Balboa. Um, she played a character there. She was um, one of the one of the boxing gloves. Yeah. Dramia Walker, she played the uh, um the other wife. Um she was all she was in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, which I believe is that a movie we're gonna cover? No, it is not. No, okay. okay. Unfortunately. I was thinking Once Upon a Time in Hollywood was on the top two fifty. One of my wife's um, favorite movies. Got, uh, I've not seen it's it. Terrific. It's terrific. Been, it's been on my radar. Who is that? Who's the director? Scorsese. That's Scorsese. No, okay. uh Tarantino. Sorry, sorry. Okay. Tomato, tomato. Um, the actor that played the other son, um, he was in Annabelle, Annabelle Creation, um, I Am Number Four, Evan Almighty, The Pursuit of Happiness, RV, Catch Me If You Can, which we'll see him again in Catch Me If You Can. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe. I don't know how big of a character he's got, but very minor. he's in that. Um, and then last but not least, John Carroll Lynch, for yeah. me at least on my list. Um, he was the barber in this film. Mm-hmm. He was in The Trial of Chicago 7, American Horror Story, many, many episodes of American Horror Story. Yeah. The Founder, that's, uh, that's the McDonald's story. Mm-hmm. Ted 2, Crazy Stupid Love, Shutter Island, which we've seen him in previously. The Drew Carey Show, Gone in 60 Seconds, Face Off, Volcano, Fargo, which we've seen him in previously, and Grumpy Old Men. And this is our this is our last top 250 appearance with John Carroll Lynch, and I've liked him in all three of them so far. I miss with Brian Haley. You mentioned The Departed. We haven't seen it yet. It is top 250, so we'll see him again. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Um, yeah. That darn cat is not on the top 250. No. Nor is uh, Baby no. Stay Out. No, we won't see him in that. <laughs> um, IMDb. This movie is 8.1 out of 10 on IMDb. It's currently sitting at number 178 on the top 250. What's this movie's history on the top 250? So when it first appeared, it was 226. That was December 2008. And by January 2009, so just a few days later, really, uh, it had hit 83. Uh, and it slowly descended at a pretty steady rate. Uh, when the algorithm updated in 2022, it jumped up about 50 points, as many movies did. And it's continued to fall at that same rate. Before the algorithm updated, it was 191. And then right now it's not 177. So, you know, given another... Given another 10, 15 years, it might fall off. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. I I would be disappointed if that happens, but I'll save that for the end of the episode. Um, <gasps> sizzle. 81, sizzle. Ooh, <laughs> suspense. 81% on the tomato meter, critics, and 90% audience. What was the budget for this film? 25 to 33 million, which means we don't actually know. Uh, since 2008 or nine. Eight. There has been roughly 45% inflation or reported inflation, bringing that to 37 to 48 million. Jacob, as our guest, uh, mm-hmm. uh, what, what causes inflation? Um, corporate greed. That's the uh, <laughs> three, by f- three, three by five index card of allowable p- opinion answer, I believe. Yeah, corporate greed. Correct. We would also <laughs> allow money printing. We prefer it. Well, no, we don't prefer it. We don't like it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We um, we endorse money. Printing. Money doesn't grow on trees. It grows in the Federal Reserve. Yes. That's right. On Jekyll Island. Dead water. Well, actually, Jacob, money is made of linen, so it kind of does grow on trees. Lemon? Len- linen. Linen and cotton. John Lennon. Except uh, the gold bugs would say that's not real money, and they have uh, they have an argument. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. I mean, it's better than Bitcoin. I mean, Bitcoin's too unstable. Can you money? Can you imagine having a currency that doesn't have a consistent value over time? <laughs> yeah, Bitcoin's not even real. <laughs> only used. It's only used by criminals. <laughs> There's so many libertarian in jokes here that, like, the non-libertarian <laughs> listeners are just like, just completely. <laughs> Over <laughs> yeah things that we hear a hundred times uh, all right yeah onward so, and upward yeah this film is about an old man who uh recently becomes a widow widower widower um we we stumble upon him at his his wife's funeral we realize that there's an estranged, estranged relationship with him and his sons 
Um, he has a pretty nasty opinion about his sons and the way his grandkids are being raised. He lives in a house, which I, we, we assume he's owned for a long time. And recently that area has been, the culture's kind of shifted in the area and a lot more of Hmong people have moved in to no, that area. Hmong, you don't pronounce the H. Hmong, okay. Yeah. Hmong people have moved in since, since he's lived there. Clint Eastwood's character, Walt, I believe is his name. Yeah. He fought in a war against Korea, Korea people of similar cultures as the Hmong people. And so he has a preconceived notion or dislike for. Well, I mean, call a spade a spade, Jeff. He's racist. Yeah, he is. He is. And I, he never really. That's, that's one thing that never, never really resolves. I. With. Like I like, like the way becomes, it resolves. I do. I do too. I love like this. This movie is wonderful. But like he falls in love with the his neighbors. Yeah. I don't necessarily think he would be welcoming to any culture outside of the people he's finally grown to love. So, like I don't think he became a non racist by the end of the film. Sure. Sure. I just think he found the humanity within the people that live next to him, and that was enough for him to say, "Okay, you're in my circle." Mm-hmm. But anyone else. <laughs> We'll I have to go through the same dislikes, same rejections. Yeah. Um, so I don't think his racism thoughts ever changed in this film. I, I like, th- like in general, I'm inclined to agree. I think this kind of goes back to what we were talking about a few weeks ago uh, with uh, the way civil rights was handled in America. I think that this story is a lot more uh, true about how racism is defeated through, through, Exposure, uh, exposure uh, therapy. Yeah, exposure therapy. <laughs> Here's a oh, black man. <laughs> you're racist. Oh, you're gonna live in Chicago. Yeah. That's your punishment. Yeah. Yeah. Punishment. Yeah. There are some really bad like comedy skits you could do about like KKK men and rehab, and like the lights turn off, and then the black people come in just open their eyes. <laughs> uh, oh god! And like, anyway. all right, for the first thirty seconds, just get it out of your system. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I no, I, I, I do think that this is the way racism is truly defeated, right? By people being exposed to other cultures, um, by non-coerced living in community with each other, right. you, you're bound to interact, right? And and that's what breaks down those barriers. Being told don't be racist doesn't Mm. actually work right if telling people not to do bad things was sufficient we wouldn't need police right we wouldn't need any kind of you know criminal justice so one of the things that stood out the second my second time through this film and i'll open this up to the floor here is i i I knew like i remembered pretty much the whole gist of this movie i forgot forgot the ending about exactly how it all went down but um I forgot just how much animosity was between him and his sons. Mm. And Mm. it kind of got me thinking, I was like, what, who was in the wrong in that situation? Uh, Like should, should Walt have been a little bit more open-minded to more modern style set of parenting, or should the sons have been a little bit more like, like, like in that relationship, in that downfall, where, where, where do you guys speculate it went wrong? Like, was it both or was it just Walt? being stern in his ways turned off the ability to let the family be flexible and let them kind of spread out a little bit. Does that make sense? Like where, where did that relationship go wrong before we even get into the new, new relationship Walter came into contact with? One of the things that I've, I noticed watching the movie was that his whole extended family, his sons, his, his grandchildren are extremely materialistic. Um, you know, there's the concerns about who's going to get the car. There's the time where his one son called about like, Hey dad, do you still do a guy that gets season tickets to the, I forget what yep. team it was. Um, but lions, lions, which, uh, geez, 2008 wanted to go see the lions. I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that was those a bit gotta of a be hard to the... come by. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no one could get their hands on those tickets. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. So it's, I, and I don't. I mean, I might be reading a little bit into it, but you don't really get the sense from watching Walt that of his many 
maybe like, you know, character flaws that the film does a good job at highlighting. And he has many possessions, but he doesn't seem like an overly materialistic person. He seems like kind of a no nonsense, kind of like he yeah. just he likes the things he has. He has his prized possessions, but he, he mm. kind of views them more in a like it's it's a it's valuable because of the history, the sentimental right. value of it, right. you know, not just like, you know, uh, a, you know, a strict sort of like uh, love of, of things and possessions, which you kind of see coming from his kids, his kids and grandchildren. And right. I mean, I guess he raised them. So maybe there was some like failure on his part to instill certain values. But, you know, at some point, I mean, I, I that, you know, sometimes in movies, there are certain like if it was maybe one criticism I had, like sometimes I felt like they were laying that on a little bit too thick, like mm. when the granddaughters like, so what's going to happen when like you like die when you die I was like <laughs> uh, i was like yeah i mean you know maybe a little bit of criticism there like it, it doesn't yeah. it doesn't distract you too much because it's a quick scene but i was like i mean that's almost like you know a little bit of over you know yeah. writing that part there but that, it, it drives the point home that child was a little too old for that to be like an innocent question you know like if it was like a five-year-old like grandpa what happens when you pass away like grandma like that's more of like a this is new to me, but for that girl to be a teenager and her, for her to go like, Hey, so who's gonna, who's gonna get this when you kick the can? Like, that's like, yeah, like, like that. I don't feel like that happens. I agree with you on that. Like that, that was a little, I think over dramatized. Um, we, I do want to say, I looked it up. The, the 2008 record for the Detroit lions. Oh, 16, right? Yeah. I was 16. Say, yeah. That's, why, <laughs> so, I, that, that's what I remembered. So I was like, <laughs> I was like, well, he said it was a line. It's like, man, like that. I don't think that who wrote that script, like it's, the script was probably written like before 2017, the 16 2016. Season, yeah. But like, yeah. man, that doesn't age well. <laughs> how, how did they do in 2007? Uh, yeah, hold on. I'll look, I'll look it up. <laughs> 207 Detroit <laughs> Lions. Seven and nine. So not great. Not great. Still not yeah. great. I mean, that's good by today. So you can get into the playoffs nowadays at seven and nine, but you know, or I guess just, that would be like seven. And, you have an extra game. So two thousand six was three and thirteen. So yeah, while this movie was being wrote, the Lions were not good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So there's any anywho. Yeah, I just the because like I I was a punk kid. Like I played a lot of jokes and stuff. But like, and my I had a grandfather that was pretty stern, but like there was never that relationship of like. Oh, he doesn't understand that I'm an immature kid. Like, so the one moment in the film early on when one of the grandsons goes up and he crosses himself and he quotes the Austin Powers movie, Spectacles, Testicles, Wall and Watch. Like, I, I'm like, he's a kid. Like he's, he's in a, he's in an uncomfortable place. He's in a, he's in a, a faith based funeral. And we, we can assume maybe they're not a church family. Like, and so he's uncomfortable. Like I crack jokes when I'm uncomfortable. It's like, I, I, I would have had a little bit more grace for him. You know, like, like I just, but like he has to have known, like kids were kids back in the day when he was a parent, you know, like Catholic churches are different though. I know, but like his sons could not have been like, his sons had to have been like goofy or kooky at some point. Like maybe that's that why they didn't be, get along. That can't be abnormal <laughs> for him, for him to have kids be kids, no matter the location. So like, so like that was just like, man, like, He's not even allowing them, like just, to, just giving them a little bit of grace. But then I get like they're setting up his. I get they're setting up his walls, yeah. but like, but at the same time, I'm just like, like, yeah, you're like these are kids. You know, this but, is a movie where if it was being made today, and you had the right director doing it, because I could see how it could be done badly. But if it was being made today, it would almost be interesting to see them do like a de aging on Clint Eastwood to show like maybe slight flashbacks to mm. uh, how he raised his kids, have like a, just a couple like right. little like flashbacks of interactions they had throughout the years, tastefully, thoughtfully put in certain contexts. I would have, you know, cause a lot of this is, and to be fair, there's nothing wrong with this style of, of storytelling is where you have to do a lot right. of inference. Right. right. Um, and we, yeah. we can infer a lot from the relationship that's very strained between right. uh, Walt and his family. And ultimately like the, the end result, which plays into the main plot of the movie is that Walt is very much alone. Like his yeah. wife was pretty much his life and she's gone now. And like, other than his kind of comforts and routines and his, his, uh, his dog, he has nothing to live for, you know, by, by the time this movie really gets, Get going. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, and I, I agree with all that. Some these, some of these things I just brought up, I just like I was just just trying to like get into the psyche about it and just trying yeah. to break that down. So I'm like, yeah, none of this like, I mean, if anything, these these did set up how we view Waltz. Like I I appreciated all the characterization of him, but just at the same time, I'm like some of it felt a little bit like heavy handed. Even though, yeah, like, yeah, like just like yeah. So the movie, just, the movie yeah. has like it's not a terrible start, but it's like. Like if you were going to judge the movie based off the first fifteen twenty minutes, you would not necessarily be like singing its praises. Right. Um, it it mm-hmm. has a little bit of a, I mean, rough start might be overstating it, but it's it's not the the smoothest, most like uh, catch free start that, to a movie that you, you could hope for. Agreed. I think yeah. also the the opening is so heavy handed that it kind of becomes a predictable character arc for him. You know, but it doesn't quite do the full arc that you'd expect either, right? Like he dies still a curmudgeonly, grumpy yeah. guy that doesn't care much for his he kids. Doesn't, he doesn't really get redemption, even as the hero. Well, like, like I don't like, know. I, we'll, we'll get like, into that. I think as we go along, I, oh, I, I, I will say I think I can see your point that maybe like you you can almost predict the way the story is going by how overhanded the beginning is. But I mm-hmm. will say that uh, part of what I like about this movie is that it it does a redemptive arc in a way that is extremely believable because Walt's changes, yes, he are, are like they're they're they are so well written and and Clint Eastwood is such a good job at like at really selling them like at every mm-hmm. point when he kind of softens towards his neighbors and opens up a little bit more towards you know Tao or towards uh what's her name sue i think um it, it it's never where like you feel like okay this is just like they're moving the story along it's like you actually like they they earn those small little character developments as the plot yeah. progresses right. and 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 it does so in a way that like you can almost forget that like it's it's a movie because it's very realistic and because like it's not it's not like he suddenly by the end of the movie is you know some some hippie going around and like you know like i i would bet he would still be against immigration i would bet that he'd still be sort of like um you know probably not like you know completely expunged of certain uh yeah. racial and other sorts of prejudices that he probably has yeah and probably uh, still not but, attending the catholic church probably not yeah I don't probably think not although going. there's I don't know his his redemptive arc has a, has definitely some spiritual undertone to it, and I I don't mm-hmm. want to like jump too far ahead into that, like because that's kind of like giving away the end of the movie, which we haven't talked about yet. But uh, <laughs> but his relationship, uh, I I really like not necessarily his development on the religious end because that's more understated, but uh, Father Janovich's development as a sort of uh, foil and kind of like a uh not quite an antagonist or i guess you could almost pose him as like a like uh secondary antagonist of sorts uh yeah to to walt um but his development as like he comes in with this sort of like very naive very like you know it's like catholic like very like sunday school version of christianity and then it yeah butts up against clint's like harsh reality of his lived experiences and i think that's part yeah. of what i like about this movie is is you know, as someone who came from like a very evangelical background that did sell a very like, you know, Veggie Tales version of, of Christianity. And and I spent a lot of time in my own work and my podcast talking about very brutal realities, talking about the consequences of war and the consequences of totalitarian and authoritarian government policies and just uh and, and violence that happens uh between people. Uh, we live in a very ugly world and Christians are sometimes not good at dealing with that. And so seeing uh, the father sort of have to adapt, like he comes back over and over again to deal with Clint and like there's that, uh, sorry, deal with Walt. And there's that one point where Walt comes, I think it's like the third or fourth time. And then uh, Walt's like, okay, I'll give you credit. Like this time you came you're persistent. prepared yeah. like your 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 arguments are actually stronger this time like you're not just kind of like selling me sort of like the you know Campbell's soup for the soul version of 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 faith and 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 religion yeah 
Yeah, absolutely. And I'd also say the 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 pastor does a a good job, I think, in that regard. Like a lot of Christians aren't persistent. A lot of Christians aren't willing to come up with complicated answers to difficult questions. But also, in a weird way, this is something that Jeff and I have talked about a lot. One of our criticisms, and I'm sure you share this, of of Christian movies is that because they shy away from the ugly so much, you, you tend to get inauthentic stories. And so sometimes non-Christian movies like this end up having better Christian messaging than actual Christian movies. I, I, I wouldn't say that this yes. guy's execution is flawless and, and his representation of Christendom is, is great even, but uh, it's a better picture of the church than I think we often get. Yeah, I agree. It's it's sort of like it's it's a playing out of how we as Christians have to de- like understand our religion at a, a level that marries it to the reality of the world that we currently live in. And it's also kind of an archetype for like just growing up, right? Like sort of like our, our youthful, naive view of the world and then having to yeah. come to grips with it. But then like at, by the end, it's like you come to grips with it and instead of letting it take your faith away it's made your faith stronger it's sort of like what you see right. happen with with uh with father uh janovich by the end so he gets a kind of cool character arc too even though he's not the main protagonist of the story and there's kind of right. like a lesson there for, for for people i think yeah yeah uh walt calls him a overeducated 27 year old virgin who likes to hold the hands of ladies who are superstitious <laughs> and promise them eternity that's that's quite the jab he takes it at the church. Do you think that that's a, a trap that the church, uh, at least the modern church, falls into? Of like this watered down, superstitious more than anything, more than actual like doctrine? Yeah, I think that not just Catholics, I think Christianity in the West has much too often become a just this is how you get to heaven card. Mm-hmm. And just uh, mm-hmm. like... And and that's not what Christianity actually uh, preaches. It's it's it's. I mean, there's of course elements of eternity and eternal life, but it's also about our life here and now, and um, what the gospel message means for us as individuals and our families, our communities, in our nations, even. And there, there's a transformative power uh, to the gospel message. That's what it preaches, and. Uh, it, it's funny, I've been doing a lot of eschatology on my podcast lately, and you know, you get into the imagery that's described about what the church is going to do and how the church is like a, uh, you know, it, there's this imagery in, in Zechariah at several points about how there will be living waters flowing down from Jerusalem and that they'll encompass the entire nation, so the entire world, and you know, all the, all the nations. And that's maybe like uh and maybe i'm reaching a little bit here but like the like i i understand a lot of people will look at this story and kind of maybe take like the really surface level analysis analysis and be like well this is about overcoming racism and i'm like i actually feel like that's like more like like yeah there's there's an element of that there but i think that's kind of more that's like less it's it's not overcoming racism it's a B plot it's how do you it's like the b plot it's like it's more about well, how do you overcome racism? And you right. don't overcome mm-hmm. racism through just sort of like this, like diversity is our strength and ooh, racism bad, racism icky, uh, sort of shaming tactic that you see from the left. But you overcome racism through an understanding of human depravity being universal, but then also of God's love and mercy being universal to all individuals. And you know, it's like the, the, the uh, racial tensions that exist today existed even in biblical times. Jews and Gentiles did not did, did not get along very well. And even right. within the Jewish community, there were, you know, like Jews and, Samar- like Jews and Samaritans had. Yeah, I mean, there was all sorts of problems. And Jerusalem the Christian and Judah. message. Yeah. And, and the Christian message says, like, no, like, you know, there is no Jew, no, no Greek, no male, no female, no slave, no free. All are one in Christ Jesus. That's Galatians 3. And to me, that's like that's that's not like overcoming racism. That's more about like overcoming just the lens of 
us versus them. And that that yeah. takes shape and form in more than just racism. Like that can that can again happen within ethnic groups. That can happen. I mean, even in this movie, we see that uh like with um what's his name? Spider and the and the gang he has, and they're trying to draw Tao in, and it's just like like they're all the same ethnic group, but on what the one side, you know, of this eth- ethnic group is the family trying to maintain their traditions and stay out of trouble, and the other one is this gang and you know, they're like threatening violence against Tao and their family if, you know, they don't like give them what they want, they don't cooperate, if they disrespect them. And that's very much like at one point he's like I don't remember what he said, but he's just basically implying like if you don't join us, like you're not gonna be with us, like we helped you out. And if you if you're not gonna, you know, reciprocate and be part of us and ride with us, then like you're our enemy. And so it you know, it's you know, and that's ultimately what drives war, right? Like Walt talks about the horrors of war. Well, war is basically fundamentally at the end of the day, always a breakdown where we no longer look at other people through the lens of they're a fellow image bearer of God, but rather, well, they're the other group. They're the out group. They're not part of us. So mm-hmm. I, th- anyway, that's that's a lot of what I see at play here. And yeah, and Christianity has a lot to say about that. It's well, it's like a lot more than just the message of like, you know, well, when you die, you'll go to heaven and see your loved ones again. Like that, and that is unfortunately, I'll, like that's a meme of sorts of Western Christianity, but it's kind of an earned yeah. meme. Yeah, absolutely. I I recently watched the nineteen thirty eight Robin Hood, <clears throat> filmed in Technicolor, by the way, and uh, it's one of the rare Robin Hood stories where the where they highlight that it wasn't just like the aristocracy versus everybody else, but that the aristocracy were all Norman and the ruled were all Saxon. So even there, you've got like, they're all Britons, right? They're all English, but there's the ethnic divide, even though you couldn't tell by looking at either one of them, whether they're a Saxon or a, or a Norman, they know, right? And they know the difference. And that, that, that like tribalism is the default, right? Like it goes back, all of history, like people are able to identify uh, that someone's different real quick. And, and that's something that is overcome through non coercive means best. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, I agree. Jeff. Yeah, no, I, I agree. The, um, the one thing I was thinking about early on, Jacob was talking about how this movie's like, it's not about, the cure for racism or whatever, but it's just it's mm. more of a situational thing. Like I was, I was thinking we've, we've um kind of, kind of gone off topic, but it, it'll make sense here at the end where my brain was going. We've talked a couple times on this podcast about the ineffectiveness of mission trips. Yeah. And how not necessarily from the trip taker perspective, but of the trip receiver end, um, whoever's on the receiving end of that mission strip, like there can be, there there can be negative effects. Not always, um, but like there, but like there can it can take away from a more deep and long impact versus just temporary fixes, quick fixes coming in, seeing a different country and leaving. But yeah, the thing that came to mind talking about how like the 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 long fix for removing hate and removing racism from just any culture is, is immersion. And I think like, I look, I see very little of my impact or, or I look back very little about the impact I've had on mission trips, but I I do look fondly on the impact that they had on me mm. and being able to experience different cultures and realize, yeah, we're not like, we're more same than the different, than different. And like, I shouldn't, shouldn't be like, like, cause like I'm not an adventurous person. So like cultures scare me, not because of like, <laughs> not because of like, I'm afraid like, like the food scare me, like trying different things. And then being somewhere, if that food goes South, like, like stuff like that, like that freaks me out. Like it's like, I have high anxiety when it goes to leaving my comfort zone and stuff like, but, but doing those things like really goes like, Oh, it wasn't that bad. Like there, this is more comfortable and more like home than I thought it would be. I, I, I talked about this a couple of days ago in a class I was teaching. They they were talking about Buddhism, Buddhism and um and Hinduism. And one of the, it was a middle school class and and they were um 
they were talking about just like, yeah, but like as Christians, like we don't like them, right? Like, like they dis they disagree. So like we we don't they're the enemy, right? We, we well essentially it's like they didn't use the word enemy, but like they were essentially saying like they're not our friends. Like we we don't homie don't play that essentially. Like, and I was like, guys, no, like God created them, like they may not believe what they're intended and what they were designed to do, but God created Hindus. God created the people that believe in Buddhism. God created the people that are monks and and like, and all these like, and like, I don't know how much that little discussion had an impact, but just like, but that was kind of my reception of like, when I go on mission trips, like it's just kind of those awakenings of like, I don't know why I'm so intimidated by different cultures. Like in God, like we're on, we're on this level playing field when it comes to, how God views us and and his desires Mm. for us and, and our love for each other and stuff. It's like, I just, I kind of took in in an optimistic perspective of mission trips. Like I think they can have an impact on the mission trip goer Um, more as like a cultural impact versus a cultural help types in scenario. But I, I know like I've had a lot of stereotypes and a lot of issues removed by, by immersing myself in those situations. Speaking of long-term versus short-term fixes, I like the relationship between Tao and Wall, which kind of gets at, you know, like, what are long-term fixes? And yeah. it, there, there's there's a lot of Christian and libertarian upsh- upshots here. I mean, the idea of, yeah. like, like, people being drawn to violent, uh, like, violent ideologies and, and violent groups and gangs when they don't have easy means to take care of themselves otherwise. Uh, But then when Tao is, uh, you know, so he tries to steal the car, gets uh, gets foiled, and then has to try to make atonement, well, that ends up being the best thing that could have happened in his life because he then learns skills, he learns personal responsibility i think then he learns to have self-worth and to speak up and to have a voice and that's ultimately you know what leads him to go down a different path than he might otherwise have gone down and i think about all the core like there's so many corollaries domestically with all of like like this movie does a good job at depicting the sort of dynamics that are at play in a lot of very urban areas um of of western society and how like it doesn't matter how much government money you throw at these 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 places, but rather what it would take is I mean, I think there are systemic problems that need to be addressed, but on individual levels, what people need isn't necessarily handouts. It's not like someone coming in and just cleaning up the street just for it to get dirty again in a couple of weeks or fixing up a couple of homes and then what like, you know, some drive by shoot you know, shoot shootings and lack of long-term maintenance they just break down again but what it takes is actually like you know people to learn uh to take care of themselves and also to kind of work together as a community and there's so much at play there you know i mean not just between walt and Tao, but like the way that walt helps out the crap what's their last name the uh i can't Our remember the family the, the, next door yeah i forget their last name i think it's lawn or lawn or lower something like that um but yeah. but yeah anyway taking care of the, the Hmong family next door he does a lot to take care of them like like helping them with fixing things and helping out with their with, with Tao and kind of teaching him taking him under his wing and and then they help him by like hey he's alone and he doesn't necessarily know how to make food and take care of himself so they help him and so there's a really great aspect there of like mutual aid it's like neither of these families problems are solved by government or even by like you know church programs it's just people helping each other and serving one another it's another very christian idea of of serving one another so i i think there's a lot a lot there that we can glean from and then also like i think there's even corollaries to you know international conflicts going on and it's just like you don't this is again inference right there a lot this movie is a lot of showing and not telling uh right but but you can get the sense that walt starts to see that maybe you know like i i, I judge these people by 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 like their, their their race and their collective identity and i only associate negative things with them but i think he kind of learns through his getting to know that family and through instilling 
skills and growing relationship with Tal that, you know, what? like a lot of these people are probably ending up like these violent thugs that cause all the problems of the movie because they didn't really have like another option. And I think that's a lesson we should take that away. Like whether that's here domestically, whether that's even internationally, you know, like think about like a lot of Islamic terrorism and whatnot. And I think that too often we just want to go, well, it's, there are so many Christians and Americans that just go, well, it's just Muslims or like, you know, Muslims are just violent. It's like, well, like that, (laughs) I don't, I don't think that's true. I think that there's a lot of Muslims who are, I don't agree with their religion, but like they're not violent because they're Muslim, but rather their, their ideology can take on a violent bend when there are certain power imbalances and certain you know, systemic issues and envir- environmental factors. But but no one wants to look into the long term solutions, right? People don't right. Want, because long term solutions, they mean real work investing in relationships. They mean long term work. It means uh putting as you kind of talked about, Jeff, putting yourself outside your comfort zone. And people yeah. don't like that. We we do not want to put ourselves outside of our comfort zone. Another thing here that I think is explored in a very interesting way is that several times Walt is blatantly racist to their faces, yeah. and some people get offended, but notably with Sue, she seems to be unoffendable. When the when the three guys in the corner have her, you know, cornered, she's a bit of a spitfire, but then when Walt is, you know, casually racist with her, she just laughs and and almost like leans into it and you know when yeah. he makes the joke about don't eat my dog and she says oh we don't eat dogs we eat cats and she's like <laughs> and for a second he's like really and she's like no like we don't eat pets <laughs> i i think um there's a lot to be said about being unoffendable i yeah. think being offended in a in a kind of backwards way feels good you know uh and that's why yeah. it's the easier option to take it feels good. It feels righteous. It feels just. But oftentimes the most loving thing you can do is. So when I did Disaster Relief, we had to read a lot of different books. And most of them I thought were kind of useless. But one of them, he takes way too long, like beating the point in. But just the 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 generality of it was about like being unoffendable. Because if you can't be offended, you're you're much more much more primed to love on people that hate you and using comedy too. Like comedy is such an effective tool in our toolkit for not only like combating certain prejudices, but just for like dis deescalating conflict and mm-hmm. helping to sort of like, you know, build bridges and, and kind of like lean across the aisle and whatnot. So I think there's, yeah, there's a lot there. Like, I mean, pretty much this movie, like if you were going to view it for the, through the lens of what maybe the left would want to do, the progressive culture would, would want to do in terms of like just like you know it's all about combating racism it's like well okay even if you're going to just reduce this movie to that this movie presents a blueprint for combating racism that is at every step the opposite of what the progressive conventional wisdom tells you to do <laughs> yeah it tells it, so. the the progressive wisdom is you ostracize right the racist whereas this is like no no no. you welcome him into your home you love on him uh it reminds me of are you, are you familiar with daryl davis yeah so daryl davis for i am the, not okay so jeff daryl davis is a, a lounge singer and pianist uh a black i got to see him black play once by me. the way have you yes I've, uh, he's, yes, I, he's he, one of my he heroes was, he, i want to meet him someday he was in a freedom fest in memphis last year and i got oh, to nice. see him play so correct if I get any of this story wrong, Jacob, uh, but he was playing a show and after the show, he sat at the bar and the guy sitting next to him, they struck up a conversation. He said something to the effect of, uh, I never thought I'd have a conversation with a black man, something like that. And Daryl's like, OK, why not? And the guy pulls out of his wallet a, like a laminated card that he is in a, a, a literal card carrying member of the KKK. And they become friends. Daryl chooses to to love this guy as best he can. They become friends. He eventually starts getting invited to like cookouts and stuff with other KKK members. And last I saw, something like 
through through this little act of of loving on this guy and and being consistent so over 200 i think it's over 250 kkk members have given him their robes as they leave the kkk yep, yep. like just radical radical uh, actions of love i don't know if he's a christian i've not heard anything in what he's said to give me the impression that he's not uh but it also it, like nothing confirming or denying it in what i've heard him say but it's it's um it, it's interesting because you'll see a lot of messaging from the left demonizing hate, but they don't seem to understand that the way to do, to get rid of hate is by the opposite of hate, right? You can't just like it's something that can't have simply the absence of. You have to fill that with something, right? Right. So Daryl Davis is a Christian. I just looked it up. Oh, um, okay. That and, doesn't surprise me. He seems it. Yeah, it doesn't doesn't surprise me at all. Well, I think what you just said there kind of segues to something I I guess I wanted to say, which relates to the ending of the movie, um, because like the the tensions rise right, and mm-hmm. like Walt kind of like antagonizes the the gang that's harassing the family and yeah. embarrasses them, and you know they make threats, which then they make good on because they they come by and do a massive drive-by shooting of the house and then they assault uh sue and it's just it's mm-hmm. just horrible i mean it's like it's gut-wrenching you know everyone's people are covered in blood in the house and everyone's yeah. confused and then they don't know where sue is and then she comes in and and just i mean you know extremely yeah. bloody and gory and it's just awful and walt drops his cup he's just horrified and you can tell he just he feels responsible to an extent for Right. For what happened, and like he's already lost so much in his like he's lost his wife and he's alone. And then he thinks he finally has something like a community again and people that he can almost consider like a family, and they're in danger and yeah doesn't know how to how to solve. I think he'd already had a couple conversations about the the gang violence with the father, and the father talks mm-hmm. about how like the police have been completely ineffective; they can't do anything, and yeah. Uh, things like that and so walt decides to take matters into his own hands and i i love the way that he gets really raw with with tal like he locks like tal like like we're gonna go and get revenge on these guys and walt like tricks him and locks him in his basement and yeah just like tells him straight out and i just love this scene he's just like you do not know like what you're getting into like you think it's easy to kill you know kill a person like it's the worst thing in the world and like he's like i should know i killed so many people and then he you know in the war and he shares a story with Tao about like this trauma he's been holding on to how there was a young you know uh a korean boy pro- mm-hmm. or uh probably around Tao's age who was like begging for mercy and walt just bayoneted him to death like you know and that's and, how and he that's, got his silver he, star and that's how it yeah and he's just you know, just like there's it, it, sort of a moment of like raw emotion in sharing that and just the horrors of war and violence. And he's just like, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to let that darkness touches you. And then what Walt does is uh, like or like there have been several parts in the movie where he did this. I love they paid it off where he like had like first he'd like go into his jacket, pull his hand out and like pretend like just holding his not holding a gun, pretending to hold a gun. He like yeah. pretend to shoot the people in front of him. And then he'd pull out a real gun and they'd be like, oh crap. And they, you know, back off. Mm-hmm. Well, they had seen that before. So he goes to their house and like the father had tried to like bring the police there and they were like, we can't stay any longer. We got to go. So then Clint, so then uh, Walt shows up and he does the thing where he pulls his hand out and then puts it back in. And then of course, when he pulls it out again, they think it's going to be a real gun. So they shoot him, but it wasn't. He just had, I think, what was he holding? Was it like a, a lighter? For, I think for his, uh, yeah, it was the lighter with the emblem of the regiment he was in. Right. But because they killed him and he was unarmed, that gives the police the ability to act and and put put all of them in jail and keep the family safe. Um so he puts his life down on the line for these people he initially hated that moved in next to him and it just what what this reminded me of is one of my favorite passages from John 15 where Jesus says you know, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Mm-hmm. And it's just mm-hmm. such a beautiful 
uh, moment. And like Walt is still like a flawed person, right? Like it's not like he yeah. suddenly transformed overnight and became this this hero. He still has many of uh, the character flaws he started the movie with, but he's able to overcome those flaws and limitations because he's learned to love other people uh you know mm. that are that are different than him and you know to the point where he's he's willing to you know do the ultimate act of love and put his life down to keep them safe yeah where, where do you think because where do you think in his story that we see depicted in the movie is that turning point from i'm going to take a real gun to go take care of these guys versus no I'm going to choose nonviolence. Like, do you think, hmm. like, do you think that's something like that, that, um, that, that desire to be unviolent? Do you think that's something he had by the beginning of the movie because of the war? Or do you think that's something no. that was cultivated throughout his relationship with the Hmong people next to him? Like, like, and in, in, in realizing like taking a life doesn't solve the issue. Like, do you think, like, I'm just saying like, I think it's because yeah, like, I think he holds on to his gun through the whole movie. Like, like, like we see right. him. he uses it when, when, when they shoot the house, he runs over with his gun. Like, like he does rely on it. But then that one moment he's like, no, not this time. Like, like, like just like, I wonder what that turn was. I, I, uh, well, I, I, I don't I guess, know. I, here's what I think. I think that cause he, he, used violence several times like you said now one time it works right yeah. he does yeah, save he sue yeah. with a with uh like a threat of violence right and yeah. and kind of applying a little bit of and so that works right and yeah like i don't think the the message of this movie is necessary pacifism but i think it does right. draw like there is a limit to what force and violence can do towards solving problems it's sometimes good for random acts of violence but for deeper rooted issues of of violence and systemic violence and cycles of violence i think i think walt thinks he can solve problems just like you know the, the way he's always done and then i think right. really just the the trauma of then seeing what happened to sue i think that's then when he realized that you know what this is because i responded to what they were doing with violence and now they're mm -hmm. responding mm -hmm. with violence and I think he, I think that's when, I mean, like, it's hard to know the exact moment, but sometime between then and then when he locks Tao in the basement, he realizes, like, this has to stop. For me mm -hmm. to save this family, we can't escalate the violence again. Because then, yeah. you know, everyone's just going to end up dead. And I think he realizes, and I think then he also, you know, in his speech to Tao, I think he's kind of making, you know, some loose connections in his head to be like, you know, like the trauma he has from war probably plays into this well to be like uh not only will not solve problems but like i live with this and i can't let other people live like this i need to shield them from that and so yeah. I, I think it's i think it's that act i think it's the seeing that it's the and like it's, it's such i think that is the most important lesson that all people christians and not need to learn in today's society because everything about today's society everything about this sort of post-world war ii consensus that we live in based around like um, the american mythos is that the way to solve problems is with a big stick and escalating violence and strike first and i i, I just feel like it's a. Uh, what's funny is that the movie does a better job at depicting reality whereas reality describes reality as a movie Right. Mm -hmm. Like the way that we're we're told the way we're portrayed things in the news, the way we're taught things in schools is what happens usually in movies, which is the good guys beat the bad guys by just being awesome, by Superior being badass, firepower. by it's the Avengers, right? Like Avengers assemble and then they just go and beat the crap out of the bad guys and the bad guys mm -hmm. are just evil and irredeemable and you just got to destroy them and they're like faceless CGI monsters. But like. It's well, it's 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 like uh, Norm Macdonald said, you know, reading through the history books and luckily, wouldn't you know it? The good guys have won every <laughs> single time. Right. There, There's a there's another side of this, too, because there is the escalatory violence, which I think is spot on. But there's also in here and I don't think it's intentional. The uh, the methodology of terrorism. Right. So there's like there's hmm, largely yeah. two. 
There's the one which is like, we're going to do a show of force so that you know not to mess with us. And that's what the drive-by shooting is. And the other methodology of terrorism is we're going to provoke you into doing something so outrageous that everybody turns on you. And that's what he does, right? He goes there not with any weapons, but provokes them to shoot him. And now they're all arrested. Hmm. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a good point. It's, uh, although I don't know. I, 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 I... I don't know what he does as terrorism. No, but, I, but I, I, I I'm not saying the way a corollary he, yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Not I, that I, what he did is terrorism, but it's the it's one of the methodologies. It is one. Yeah, it's one of their methodologies. Yeah, but it, it's so funny because like the solutions to terrorism are just kind of like the inverse of that, right? Yes. Um, and and that's yeah. I think that's one of the lessons. Like that's why I love this movie so much. I like going back to it because I think it it you know not. I don't think intentionally, but I just think it, it just happens to really showcase just like moral lessons that we need to learn as a society today. And it also obviously has, I think, very uh, like it's it it is accidentally one of the best Christian movies of all time because it uh, <laughs> <laughs> it it does a better job at sort of like demonstrating without being too heavy handed the christian story right the idea of of you know laying your life down and taking you know walt walt ends up being like a little bit of like a sort of archetype for christ because he takes the wrongdoings of like you know of everybody upon you know like he he, he sacrifices himself so that so that they can live i mean he, you know he's obviously a very yeah. flawed person he's not christ sure. but it, it it it's just a mirror that points us to uh that points us to that um, and I yeah. forget, I forget, uh, uh, what the final speech is at the end with, with the father. I, I, I'm forgetting his exact words, but I, like I mentioned earlier, that, that pays off as well. Cause by the end he's like, you know, Walt was a very real, I think he's like, Walt, he, I think he recounts the things that Walt says to him and says like, you know what? Like he was true. It was true. I was naive. I, I didn't understand quite how dark the world was. But then he's also able to see how Walt was impacted by 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 him and by by love, which is you know ultimately what Christianity is about. Yeah, a hundred percent. I pulled up that bit of, of monologue here. One Walt Kowalski once said to me that I didn't know anything about life or death because I was an overeducated twenty seven year old virgin who held the hands of superstitious old women and promised them eternity. Walt definitely had no problem calling it like he saw it, but he was right. I knew really nothing about life or death until I got to know Walt, and boy did I learn. So, yeah, yeah, it's um, it's a it's a complex movie, you know. All e even just talk about the escalatory violence, and you know we haven't gotten too much into U.S. foreign policy, but here's a good time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so the Hmong are over here because we were over there. Right. If it hadn't been for U.S. involvement in Vietnam, the Vietnam conflict would have looked very, very different. I'm not saying the Viet Cong weren't ruthless in the way that they were punishing civilians before American involvement and during it. But I th it's plausible because history doesn't have counterfactuals, but it's plausible that the Hmong people would still have a home in their their region of origin. Yeah, that's a good point. I've forgotten as well that, yeah, it kind of highlights how, you know, these yeah wars have. Uh, wars have consequences, right? Yeah, and it's not just in blowback, but it's in the dislocation of people. And you know, it's funny when you talk with a lot of like, like Walt is kind of an archetype for the conservatives complaining about immigration and changing about yeah. how much the society's changed. And like, you know, listen, there are some fair points to be raised about how it's sure. a little bit destabilizing to society to have massive influxes of people from different cultures coming in. Like when it's slow yes. and steady there's enough time for assimilation when it's all at right. once it, you know that kind of forced integration is very hard sure but people want that then people focus on band-aid fixes for what are really problems that you have to like look you gotta further back up the so stream many to re yeah yeah you gotta go further up the stream realize like what where does where does this come from and it comes from a lot of american foreign policy which has yeah. and, and and the war on drugs which has I mean, you know, that those again, th these things are at, at best, except I think that's like the one moment where the movie does a little bit of telling and not showing. Mm. But but I think the entire movie, it, it is sort of in a way showing 
the consequences of not just sort of, uh, you know, Christian naivety, like we talked about at the beginning, but just you know, how government fails at multiple layers of society. It failed in its foreign policy and it's failing right there at home to, to, you know, protect people and keep them safe. And what, what ends up keeping people safe is, you know, the courageous kind sacrifice of, of one person. Yep. And that's, you know, but at the end of the day, it's like, you know, we, we should be trying to strive for a society where perhaps we don't have to hope for a, our, our old neighbors to have to resort to such desperate measures to, you know, protect their, their neighbors and, and loved ones. Yeah. Yeah. You, you use the word destabilizing, right? That a mass influx of foreign nationals can be destabilizing to uh, otherwise stable cu- culture. And, you know, almost every single person I know that's come here illegally, and I know quite a few, the countries that they're coming from are, have been destabilized. Right, yep. and usually it's been stabil destabilized through our or not ours because I wasn't I wasn't consulted on it, but through right. the, through the uh, interference of of the governments, often the governments that they're fleeing to, right? Just a, a bit ironic there. And then you know you touched on immigration is not terribly destabilizing if it's a slow trickle, but it changes when it's a mass influx, and we've seen several of those throughout history, and every single time we've seen two things. One is a, uh, a a large racial pushback, but also a, a, a upcrop of uh, organized crime from the communities that are coming in. And the reason we see that, and there's lots of good documentation on this, is that these communities become low priority security, right? And so because the police uh, aren't doing their job in that area, the people have to police themselves. Uh, they're trying yep. to push him into the gang as a form of protection, and they need the protection. He's getting, you know, he's getting harassed. That could have turned violent by a different, by a Latino gang. And the Latino gangs, you know, it's all the same thing. It's their communities aren't being protected, so they put together gangs to protect themselves. We saw it with the Irish immigrants. We saw it with Jewish immigrants. We saw it with post-Civil War Reconstruction era black communities. We saw it with Italians. Like, it, it just happens over and over and over again. It's the same story every time. What socialized defense and central planning don't work? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, that's stump a, speech. I mean, I mean, that's a that's a slightly deeper cut, but I think it's true. I think it's it, yeah. It, you, you can you can use this movie to make a lot of commentary about how like there's such inefficiency when you have a you know sort of centralized redistribution of of services and like people like they never get allocated properly and so you know they they tend to get allocated actually in the exact opposite way which is like i'm a former lefty because i tended to notice that the rich always got richer and the poor got poorer now i blame that on capitalism and then i realized like wait actually the reverse is true it's not that true socialism hasn't been tried it's that true capitalism has really not been tried although we've come close a couple times so and uh, yeah, I think that's you know not not the central thrust of the of the movie, but it's definitely one of those other lessons we can we can glean from it. But it's all connected, right? I mean, this is why yeah, you and I are, are libertarians is because we it's like the, it's our commitment to peace and our commitment to liberty are actually just expressions of the same sentiment. And yeah. this movie does a yeah. good job at kind of highlighting like the it does a good job at like really connecting all those values and and in a in a very compelling way with with characters that are believable Colorful. relationships that are believable and and they really they again i think like i said at the beginning i think they really sell walt sort of like change because it's not a it's not a transformation like he's kind of the same no. dude at the end but he's yeah. just like he he's learned to love other people despite his yeah. shortcomings and um and he's he's willing to like i i honestly don't think that changed i think walt was always a person who was willing to lay his life down for the people he loved. He just found another group of people to love and was able to, you know, have a, you know, kind of redeeming moment to his life and impact the people around him. Jacob, I know we're getting towards the end here. There's one more thing I want to talk about before we get into our wrap up questions. Jeff, uh, this is specifically teed up for you. I know that you're a big fan of John Eldridge's wild at heart. 
I was at one time a big fan. Now I, I can admire it from a distance. I don't okay. think it's the only way to admire men's ministry or you young adolescent ministry, but it, it is a perspective that has value. Yes. And it, it, it's got a lot of really great observations. And one of those that I remember distinctly is the need for young men to be initiated in a, in a sense into manhood. And some cultures, that's a like a very specific tradition that they have but not really one that we in the west have and he was kind of talking about how that's something that can be reclaimed but we see that in this film after he befriends and i, I can't remember the guy's name <laughs> after walt befriends his neighbor <laughs> Tao. young man Tao, Tao. thank you toad uh, is all i could toad think. yeah he calls uh, him toad a lot yeah <laughs> after after walt befriends Tao, he's taking him around he takes him to a barber shop and they I mean, they bust his balls a bit, right? Uh, but, but as they're walking in, he says, this is how real men talk. Pay attention. And I think this is a really interesting manhood initiation scene. And I wanted to get your thoughts. So I think that scene is paralleled with the initiation, the initiation scene of him trying to steal the car for the gang. Oh, yeah. Hmm. And I, think I hadn't even two connected pers- that. That's great. I think it's two perspectives of people, like in a sense, the gang is fighting to have, I don't want to say ownership, but have dibs on Tao. Sure. And Walt is also kind of going like, not necessarily like for dibs on him, but just going like, I want you to be you versus you to be con- locked in with someone else's leadership. Sure. Yeah. So like, so there's, there's this battle over who's, who's leading Tao. Yeah. And and so I think I think it's it's a bigger parallel to him stealing the car and getting caught versus him going with Walt getting the haircut and hearing them, you know, shoot the bull. But in the long run, it's <laughs> there. There's values there. There's I see you for you. We don't require anything from you for you to be you. Just be here. Give some crap back to us. And then that's all we need. Like, and I think there's that comparison of like, you can either be you or you can be what the gang wants you to be, which is not you. Mm. Um, and I kind of interpreted like that, like, like both were an initiation, both were an initiation. Yeah. And, um, one, one uplifted the person, the other one uplifted the actions of the group. What, what, one thing to piggyback off that, I think Yeah. the underlying theme there is, and I think this kind of is maybe why Walt, doesn't like his family is because what he values is relationship and people being present like he values people being authentic and you get the sense that his family is very much like they they just kind of like view him as like a inconvenient and they're very Mm. fake and superficial with him and whereas i think what he starts to love about the um the among family next door is that like they i mean at first he's kind of a spectacle but then like you know like he's a he's a person and yeah they're they're authentic and they're just themselves around him they're not looking to get something out of him or anything or just use him as a means to an end and i think that's what he you know him and tao kind of grow that way too because tao you know he lacks a lot of self-confidence and he's ashamed um but what he you know, he kind of earns walt's respect because he continues to be present and he he shows up and he and he earns he earns walt's respect like everyone that earns walt's respect are the people who keep showing up who are consistent and who are present the father does uh father does that um father uh what's his name um uh, janovich and then uh yeah. tao does that the family does that so i think those are good you, lessons you to also, as well <laughs> yeah uh you also see a change in tao's posture uh, and at no point that I can remember is does Walt tell him to stand up straight, right? He just he empowers him, and the kid stands up straight. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. I mean, it's it's a really good. Like I, we didn't talk a lot about Tall. Maybe we can talk about him just here at the end here. I thought his his arc was really well done. You know, d- yeah, it was really well done too. I think because you know he's now granted like he had a little bit of a regression where he just wanted to resort to violence again there at the end, and Walt kind of has yeah. to intervene. But like leading up to that, like he's he's coming out of his shell and he's, you know, he's he's going through. This was like a Jordan Peterson clean your room arc before Jordan <laughs> Peterson was a thing. Right. Like he, yeah. he 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 learns to you know clean his room and stand up with his shoulders 
back and to you know shake people's hands and you know there's a lot i think this movie probably means a lot to people who didn't have father figures in their lives and they get to see yeah you know and, and it's almost like you get the sense that walt is a father who never had a true connection with a son and tao is a mm. son that never had a, a good father and they kind of end up meeting each other's you know sort of needs in that way yeah so you're saying it's a rom-com <laughs> it's a rom-com modern western slash uh religious documentary yeah yeah that's why yeah. matthew mcconaughey was in it and i, I also think a big yeah. takeaway uh, before we get into wrap up is that you know if your neighbor has a nice car try to steal it you never know what you might learn you may end up getting the car <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you might it, that, that is a good payoff I mean, you know it's like the <laughs> And it, it's a city. It's a fitting name for the movie, right? Because like the car yeah. is sort of like the. Uh, yeah, you know, I know there's a literary device like term for this. MacGuffin. Yeah, right. It's 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 the it's the sort of uh, touchstone for the yep. entire plot of the movie. So yep, and it's they pretty say cool. it nine times too. Right. Yeah. <laughs> they say the thing. <laughs> they say the thing. They say Gran Torino nine times. All right. Uh, let's get into wrap up, Jacob. I know you don't have a whole lot of time, so we'll we'll. we'll go these a little quicker pace than usual yes sir all right first one here grand torino 2008 would you guys recommend this film oh yeah 100 percent. it might not be the first like it's not like you know if i met someone we were going to like go through like you know the movies that we have to see it's probably not going to like necessarily crack my top five it's probably my top 10 mm. he's this jumping movie, ahead this movie would be in your top 10 that's oh, crazy uh, okay, yeah that, yeah we'll come back to that i would recommend Nelson? it yeah, I I also would. Um, not to everyone, and we'll get into the next question for my reasons why. But like, there's lots of language. There is violence. There is um depicted rape. There um insinuated most, rape. In, insinuate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not depicted. Thank you. It's not a movie for all ages. <laughs> sure. Um, but I think there is a there is value in this, and there is value in seeing this sort of anti-violent resolve to what we would normally expect as, oh, we've got to duke it out type of situation. Yeah. Well, especially as Clint Eastwood, like with Clint Eastwood as the actor, like you're almost going in expecting like, you know, it's a big shootout with him. It's a yeah. big shootout, but it's... It, it Absolutely. But you do get to see him beat up a minority, so, you know, <laughs> six one, half a and, dozen of the other. Uh, did, did we look up how many how many racist innuendos were in this film? I don't know. I think, I think every sentence he said had some sort of remark in it. I think I learned some um, new ones. <laughs> yeah, gosh. I, I will say um, this... Ryan Johnson should watch this movie to learn what it means to make a movie that subverts your expectations, but in a good way. <laughs> Subvert your expectations by just being garbage. <laughs> you expected I a good movie too expect- bad. You were expecting a good Star Wars movie, and I was like, ha ha ha, I got you now. <laughs> we don't have time Jeff to get into this. Yeah. <laughs> <Man. laughs> uh, this movie is rated R. Would you guys change the rating? I mm. I wouldn't, but I also think like this is a perfect movie for like a 15, 16 year old. Hmm. I think it's about when I so on two thousand eight. Yeah, I would have been about fifteen when I watched this. So yeah, yeah. I think I was sixteen, yeah. and I, I just think that like as far as like so it's like it's not the same R as some of the other rated R movies we've seen, right? It's this is just for language. I mean, it's a bit soft for R, violence, not hard but, R. Yeah. <laughs> Oh man! Oh. Yeah. Uh, are you familiar? That, that are you nice. familiar with uh, uh, Linus Tech Tips? Yeah, that's not a real name. So he's a YouTuber, Canadian guy. Anything tech related, he's got he's got an answer for it. He's really funny. And in one of the episodes where he was doing like a, a talk back to the audience, uh, somebody says something about uh, a hard R. And he's like, oh, I use a hard R all the time. And his co-host was mortified. <laughs> and he's like, what? And he's like, yeah, I don't see a problem with it. I mean, we all used it as kids, didn't we? And the other guy is like, <laughs> cannot piece together. And then Linus, like, th- like th- keep making the same blunder. The other guy eventually pieces together. Oh, you mean, and this is also a word that's not <laughs> acceptable today, but retarded, right? <laughs> so, yeah. 
And uh, it was a very, very awkward. And it's it, so anytime anybody says hard R, that's all I can think of. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah I, I would agree. R is appropriate. I do think there are values in this for, I mean, I guess either gender of coming of age and, and especially just, just yeah. being comfortable with the uncomfortable. Um, I, so I think there is value in using it as a tool for middle teenage years and stuff, but it's definitely, definitely with the intention of using it as a talking point, not just for entertainment. I wouldn't show it to a 15 year old and be like, okay, cool. Let's move on. Like, yeah, I, I would want it to be something. Okay. Like, like what'd you think? Like, like I'd want to break it down, but I, I do think that this, yeah, it wouldn't be out of, out of the way to, to discuss it with it, to watch it with a 15 year old around that age. Sure. 2008 has it aged well or uh, did did you answer uh sorry jacob did you answer that what question was it um would you change the rating is oh i wouldn't or... i wouldn't change it no okay. i okay. keep it the same gotcha okay i mean i would abolish the rating system but other than that i mean I <laughs> <laughs> you would change all the ratings right yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Watch i would make it so watch. that only government can decide what the rating should be that way it's okay. consistent and yeah. efficient. It's regulated. Yeah. Uh, everyone wins. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Has it aged well? 2008. I'd say it aged. I, I, yeah. I would say no. I don't think this movie oh. gets made today. I think it's, it, it really? doesn't, I don't think it goes for, for modern sensibilities and the world's changed a lot in a little less than 20 years. I don't think right, well, this movie gets made where he doesn't like, so Jeff. It's aged well for step- normal people. Well, here's what I meant to say, though, is like, because c- Jeff, you had stepped away and, and Jacob and I were talking about I'm how sorry. this is in a lot. No, it's OK. This is in a lot of ways like a better Christian movie than a lot of Christian movies. And in modern cinema right now, we're seeing a lot of preachy, progressive movies. And so yeah. if this movie were to be made today, I think it would be a lot preachier about how, like, now I realize that racism is bad before he gets killed. If- Right. Yeah. Well, also, if this movie was made today, Jeff's blunder at the beginning, where he called Walt's character a a widow, would be true because he would be transgender. <laughs> <laughs> Realized late in life, I've been a the, woman the this he, whole time. The, the he she funeral. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, but yeah, that, yeah. There would definitely be. Yeah, the granddaughter would probably be of non-binary or you know yeah it's there would definitely be a sexual aspect to it where like, and I think they would even imply like that the grandfather has issues with that too. And that's another one of his faults that he, he can't see past the man and a wife. Sure. Yeah. Um, Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I definitely, I definitely, I would, I could see them playing up on that in a, in a modern, more modern version of this film. Let's see here. Does this movie need a sequel prequel? Does it need me? Does it need remade anything within that? Does it need, adapted in any way no or, but yeah, should they i mean make it? any of that stuff i mean like the most i would say is like it maybe is one of those movies that you wish there was like a director's cut or extended cut but mm-hmm. it was already pretty long though i think so but nowadays movies are three hours long so this one's just shy of two uh, I, i'm gonna be honest this movie moved quickly for me like i had when i i started this the night that we were we recorded the deer hunter and then I put this on afterwards because we get we finished fairly decent. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna watch half of this and then get ahead of it. And I didn't touch my phone. I I didn't like like I this movie Drew next you thing in. I know, I'm like, oh, next thing I know, like and I'd seen it before. Like, but then the next thing I know, I'm like, oh, it's almost over. Holy cow. I was like, so like I the beginning is a little dry, but like the rest of the film, like I was locked in. I was uh, yeah, like, I I don't think it moved slow for the majority of the film. Once, was, you know, like once case. you have like the first interaction with the father, I think with mm-hmm, Father Ganovich, mm-hmm. I think there's like no wasted motion. Like there's not much that. I yeah. would like. It's not a movie where you go, ah, oh, they didn't need that part. You know what I mean? It's like it's one of the, it's actually one of the movies where like, man, like I wish, wish there was a little bit more. Even though again, it was already a right. short movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh yeah, moving on. Uh, last two questions here. Would this be in your personal top two fifty? It's in yes. Jacob's top ten. It's in my top. It's in my top ten. I mean, it's mm-hmm. probably like right outside the top five. Probably like number six. 
Okay. Can you name your top five? You don't have to if you can. I was just curious if you can think of five movies that would be. That's the reason why this one's not in this. Um, well, two of them are Justice League. <laughs> Uh, and no. Ryan Johnson's Star Wars. Yeah. Right. <laughs> top three. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, the top three. <laughs> the original trilogy probably makes up my half of my top five. So, I mean. Okay. <laughs> They're good stuff. Okay. Uh, speaking and of. The Termi- and then Term- Terminator 2 and uh, maybe uh, Back to the Future might be up there. Okay. We haven't. De- the- both of those are on the top 250. We haven't done either of those yet. Speaking of the original trilogy. um. Walt says, how many swamp rats can you fit in one room? Uh, which answers the question I've long wondered of what it was Luke Skywalker was shooting. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> That's... Can... Oh. oh, you want me to cut that joke? Okay. <laughs> oh. oh, I don't know. Um, this this, this was... was definitely in my top 50. Top 250. Yeah, I think so too. You were about to say, Jacob. Well, somehow this movie, this episode ended up being spicier, more dark jokes than the Schindler's <laughs> List one. I, I, you know, I like making edgy jokes. It helps me feel better about dark topics. But uh, Schindler's List was so grim. I was it like, was, I can't yeah. make jokes about this. Yeah. No. Uh, oh, that was a good tough point. one. All right. Yeah. Last and, one. Yeah. Why is this film on the top 250? Why do you think this movie has top 250 status within the general populace of people who vote on the top 250? I think this is just, I mean, this movie has archetypes and story beats that have been done before, but it combines a lot of them in a very unique way, Mm -hmm. right? Like, Like it combines a redemption story, a sort of like sacrificial hero story, a old war veteran you know character uh it's just it's it's all done very well and i i think uh i think the you know in the ending like you definitely get the sense that that he's gonna have some kind of redemptive arc but i think the ending was just again like it's just everything paid off like you know you know there's that movie trope like if there's like a you know a, a a painting on Chekhov's the wall gun. or a broom yeah like a gun like like everything in this movie was used including like the like the cool little thing with his like pretending to shoot and then not so i i think that's mm-hmm. why it's just i mean it's beyond all the story beats we've already done a good job like this is just like it has some has a couple blemishes but like hey the blemishes make her beautiful right and like mm-hmm. this movie is like what movie movies should be this is how you make a good movie so it's like if you were if I was going to be a like a film teacher, like teach you like, you know, like what makes a good story? How do you make a good movie? Like what elements make up a good movie? Like how to do show and don't tell? Like mm-hmm. this is a movie that you could use like as as like a good like sort of like example. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Whereas the movie we did last week, Deer Hunter, is all show and don't tell. It takes three hours to say nothing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Please, we're begging for them to tell us by the end of the film. Yeah, <laughs> just tell us. <laughs> I, I would say, <laughs> I would say, the director and and lead actor are a big factor. Um, it was the first movie to really include Hmong community, and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, as much as I am, you know, loath to like to praise uh, representation in film and stuff. Diversity is strength, matter. damn it. It it matters to people, you know, and, and for good reason. It's it's nice to see people on screen that look like you. I get it. And and so I think those are two big aspects. Uh, I also think it's just for, like for all the things we talked about, we could have talked about another two hours more. There's a lot of good depth to this movie, and it goes about it in means that don't feel preachy. Hmm. And I think that that I think yeah. people. People don't like being preached at, but they do like being told a good thing. So, yeah, it's a, it's a believable story. Yeah. Yeah. I I think, yeah, I think for me, Clint Eastwood's name on it, the, I don't, I don't, I can't remember 2008 much as far as like what's going on politically or something, but like, Financial I don't crisis. know. If, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. So I mean, I don't know if there was, if there was something relevant with 
the Hmong community within the the early aughts of two thousands mm. that was also a part of it. But like for me, I think it, it just it's the the director, the the actor, and then just a a story with an ending that you you it, it is there's it's technically a twist ending. Like you assume there's going to be a shootout, but you don't. It doesn't happen the way you do. So like there's there's a little bit of a twist at the end, and I think just that shocking of like. Oh wow! Like he turned the other cheek versus yeah choosing violence. Like like that's that's atypical to what we would expect. Like well, now I'm thinking about this. Now I'm now I'm trying to go. Wow! Well, like what do I agree with what he did? Like it's you know there are certain movies where like there's like certain nitpicks you can make about how the climax and like the conflict happens where you go like okay like this probably could have been avoided easily if someone just did this right mm-hmm. sure. and like um for example the last jedi no sorry i won't go into that again um <laughs> <there's>, <laughs> that's like a that's too easy an example <laughs> yeah there's there's actually you know what's what's sad there's, there's a movie i was just watching the other day with my wife and we talked about this and i can't remember what it was but you know what i, th- I think you know what i mean like there are certain movies where yeah. Like it doesn't necessarily ruin the movie, but you have to kind of turn your mind off a little bit for that part and go like, okay, mm-hmm, like yeah. this maybe wasn't the Suspended most well written. Yeah. A little bit. This movie, you don't really have to do much of that. Like you kind of believe no. mm-hmm. like everything that happened, you're like, yeah, like I can see how this happened. And that like these characters, cause they're well fleshed out characters. You can see how, like, yeah, I don't think they would have done anything differently and things would have come to a head like this. Yeah, there, there's I think this movie probably came out just towards the tail end of when you could get away with issues happen because nobody has a cell phone. Right. I don't think much past 2008 you can get away with that. But yeah. a lot a lot of the stuff in this movie, like there are situations where the situation would have played differently if somebody had a cell phone. Right. If the kid, hmm. uh, if Tao, right, could have contacted somebody when he was getting harassed or had someone to contact or had someone to come pick him up or, you know, when the, when Sue was missing and they couldn't get a hold of her on the, on the landline phone right away. Like there's yeah, like that. And I didn't even like realize it really, uh, that there's no phones in this movie. Cause it, it still feels pretty modern, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the phones might've, I don't know if it made a huge difference. Like there were, there would probably still be ways to, to, to mitigate that. So, but all problems but solved. Point. By one cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> well, or, or, or telling people your plans. Like... Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I keep I keep taking shots here. You you no shots are welcome. I think. <laughs> Still thinking about it. Um, is there anything you'd like to plug or, or point people to before we close out this episode? How can people find you? Um, and everything you're about to mention will be listed in the comments below. Uh, yeah, you can. Um, I'm most active on Twitter or X as we call it nowadays. Uh, so you can look me up there at Biblical Anarchy, or you can go to biblicalanarchypodcast.com to find out more about my work and the content I create and stuff like that. And uh, that's, yeah, I don't think I have anything else I really want to plug other than that. Nice. I appreciate you guys having me How, on again. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. How often do you put out episodes? So I do an audio podcast that comes out like once a week and I do a lot of okay. like live streams and those are generally once okay. or twice a week, just kind of depending on what's going on in the world and how much content mm-hmm. I need to make. So will you be pretty, well, I guess this episode is going to air after the election. Um, but I was going to say like, but I guess for my own personal benefit, like are you going to be pretty active around election day and results and pull like, Oh yeah, I'm, some of I'm, the stuff that you I'm like doing to, okay. two different live streams on election day. I'm doing one with okay. LCI, the group on a podcast is with that's the that's the Libertarian Christian Institute and good grief, where's my book? Well this isn't video anyway, so never mind, I'm not gonna show it. <laughs> um uh, who, who wrote the book Faith Seeking Freedom. I know Nelson uh has uh, read that book before. Uh and Handed it up to all the live staff stream. members at our church. Right on. So I'll be doing live stream with them from seven to ten, and then I'll be on David Fight's show, which is a uh, fight for liberty with Free Speech Media, and I'll be on with him from ten to whenever I decide I've had enough at looking at election results. So. <laughs> uh, <laughs> assuming that those can be found, I've linked them both below. Yep. If you want to go uh, back and hear da- uh, Jacob's opinions on on the elections, 
<laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, appreciate you being on, Jacob. I, I can't imagine this will be the last time. Glad you're back. Glad you Cleveland came back. Nelson, next week, in honor of the new movie Wicked, that yes. should be coming out around the same time as our episode, yeah. we are doing The Wizard of Oz. That's right. Ni- 1939. Are you going to watch, what's it called? Dark Side of the Rainbow? Oh, Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. While you watch, play, you listen to the- Dark Side of the Moon while you watch. Yeah. No, yeah. I haven't done it in years, but it the synchronicity in it is pretty uncanny. It's it's fascinating. It's not something that I need for this movie experience. It's been a <laughs> long time. It's been a long time since I've seen The Wizard of Oz. I've seen it before. Yeah. Um, but it's been it's been a while. I've I've more recently seen the Wicked Broadway show. Yeah. I mean, that was back when I was in high school. But I've I've seen that since I've last seen. I've seen. Um, I've seen Dark Side of the Rainbow in the last 10 years, probably. Uh, but I do look forward to seeing coked up Judy Garland. Yeah. Uh, so Dave Franco, was it, was it Dave or the other Franco brother? Um, James. He did, James, he did a, um, the Wizard Oz, of Oz, the Great and Powerful. Oz, Great and Powerful, that's um, right. A Disney kind of prequel sort of connect. Yeah. That, that, I liked that film. I thought that was a cool interpretation of a, a fictional world and stuff. And it was based a lot on Frank L. Baum's book. Yeah writings there's multiple writings within i can't wait to talk about the economics that inspired it (laughs) yeah so i can't wait to listen (laughs) to suffer through it (laughs) i'll keep it brief i'll keep it brief so wait you said judy garland was on coke i have to look into that um, (laughs) to get through the episode Uh, i'm kidding um but yeah so that's next week's episode join us i'm excited for the wicked movie i will not be watching it by the time we record that episode probably not that is probably the next movie i'll be seeing in theaters is wicked part one so all right um, well goodbye everybody and check check out biblical anarchy it is terrific yes. yep to never miss for me and a sometimes reach out to jacob and said this is where you're wrong uh, <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't sound like you know <laughs> this is where i right. slightly disagree all right <laughs> thank thanks you so much on, for being jacob. on jacob yeah thanks again Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode as much as we did. If you have found value in what we discussed today, please consider leaving us a rating and review. And don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. If you have any feedback or suggestions, we would love to hear from you. That's right. Tell us why we're wrong. If you want even more content and ways to engage with us and each other, check out our Patreon page. By supporting us there, you'll get access to exclusive bonus content and help us continue to create high quality episodes, as well as help pay for our future plans. Links to our social media, merchandise, and Patreon are in the show notes.